problems, making up problems, making up solutions. Maybe we're a day train, living in the night time, staring at the dark, waiting for the sunshine. Maybe I'll be, I'll be fine. Maybe I'll be, I'll be just fine. Solutions. Maybe we're a day train living in the night time, staring at the dark, waiting for some sun. Maybe we're just New Year's resolutions, making up problems, making up solutions. Maybe we're a hairline going through some hard times. Take this puppy west for a red wine sky. Maybe I'll be, I'll be fine. Maybe. I'll be, I'll be just fine. Good morning, Central. Please stand and join us in worship this morning. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to Spoke your name into the night. In the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my Praise the one who 
Good morning. You may be seated. Welcome to Central. Great to see you all here this morning. As that song stated, we declare our living hope in Jesus Christ, and that's why we gather here today um, to praise Him, to give Him thanks for the Holy Spirit that, at work in our lives, and also one day the promise of seeing Him face to face when this earthly life is over. So we declare Him today as our living hope. A couple announcements as we get started today. Today is the day that we hand in our faith promises. If you've been on the journey with us of finding out information about our immeasurable campaign, you can see that the parking lot has already started. Um, the other part of this is going to be a, a new nursery here and a new office spaces, and also renovations of the downstairs for children's areas. We're very grateful for this opportunity to do this. Um, that God's led us to this point. If uh, you need information, if you didn't receive information in the mail or didn't attend one of the meetings, a lot of the brochures are out at the table in the atrium. And also there is a crate, a little box there to put your pledge uh, for those who decided to, to give the commitment to this project. So please place those in there today. But I would like to pray over this process, if I could, just really short, um, to say thanks for all that's going on. So, Father, thank you for your work at Central. Thank you for uh, the blessings that you give us. Father, help us to be good stewards of that which you grant us. We're so grateful 
grateful for this church, grateful for this opportunity. Thank you for the generosity of this church. Thank you for all who gather and give commitment and time and talent and treasure. Father, we pray that this project is to the glory of Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, and there are renders set up in the atrium, so if you have not seen what uh, that building project will look like when the phase is done, then in the atrium today, go walk around, check out those poster boards, and see just what those improvements will look like uh, when this building campaign is finished. Something else that Central has uh, taken a lot more intentional part in over the past year is a relationship with William Penn, specifically within their athletic departments. So they kind of started this program uh, a while back, and it was kind of like character coaches where uh, different churches, organizations could come in, they could kind of adopt a program, and then they could spend time with these teams, whether it was making meals before uh, meets or games, whatever it might be, or just ways to spend time with them. And so Tori, or, uh, yeah, Tori Durande and Cameron Armstrong uh, do a great job of leading uh, kind of that liaison relationship with William Penn, meeting with the volleyball team, uh, the women's softball team, and then we also have a relationship with the uh, cross country and track team as well. And Tori and Cameron have... Uh, just been doing studies with the softball girls kind of throughout this entire school year. That's something that has grown uh, and not just participation, but in consistency as well. And so uh, we were able to sit in with some softball girls this past week just to give us a little message on thanks for what this partnership means to them and then a way that we can support them coming up. Hello, my name is Bailey Wren. I'm Madison Tracy. And I'm Alexis Price. And we are on the William Penn softball team. We just wanted to get on here and talk to the church and tell you guys that we are so thankful for the relationship we have with you guys and it really impacts us as a team. Tori and Cameron have been great leaders for our Bible study and we just thank them so much for hosting our weekly Bible study on Tuesdays. On Saturday the 20th, we have a doubleheader at one and three. We would love for you guys to come out and support. So see you there. So this coming Saturday will be that softball game, so we hope that you can join uh, and support the William Penn Softball Girls as they host uh, a home game that afternoon. And then that next Saturday, the 27th, we are having a Serve Saturday. Sign up information can be found in your bulletin, but we'll just be doing different projects uh, here in the community, here at the church, just ways that we can come together as a body of believers and we can actively live out uh, what it means to uh, grow, to reach, to acclaim, to care, and to embrace uh, the community at large. And so we hope that you make plans to join us at something that families of all ages can do and just an easy way to get involved. And tonight, just a reminder, at 5 o'clock, we'll be having a sermon discussion uh, at the White House, just north of here. So if you're interested in attending that, um, come and let's discuss the sermon for today. So we're going to head back into a time of worship, uh, but before we do that, we'll just spend some time in collective prayer. So uh, would you bow your heads and let's pray together. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for the opportunity to come together in fellowship with one another. Lord, that we uh, can live different lives, but that we can come together for the common purpose, and that is to love you, Lord, and to give you thanks for the good things that you have done. And so, God, I just pray for the time of worship this morning, Lord, that our hearts can come from a place of gratitude for what you've done for us, Lord, how you have saved our lives, how you have redeemed our lives, and Lord, how you sustain our lives. Lord, would we just look to you and you alone this morning, God, that we would not be distracted by anything, that we would not be tempted by uh, things that would pull our gaze away from you, but that we can look at you, Lord Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, that we can fix our eyes on you, and that we uh, can be captivated by your beauty and by your goodness. And so, God, I just pray for the hearts that are here, whether uh, in this room or wherever it is that they might be watching from today, Lord, that uh, we would earnestly seek you through the reading of your word, through this time spent in worship. God, that we would lift these songs to you with glad and sincere hearts, for your name is the only one that is worthy enough to be praised. And so, God, as we sing these songs, would they not be out of a place of selfishness? Would they not be out of a place of uh, routine? But God, would they be out of a place of gratitude, of thanksgiving, and of joy for what it is that you have done, and Lord, who it is that you are. 
So God, we love you, and we thank you for the great love that you have for us, and that you demonstrated it through your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross, so that we would not have to pay the wages of sin, which is a death, but that we can inherit the gift of God, which is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. It is in his name that we pray all of these things. Amen. All right, would you stand, and let's sing together.
his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, Lord, turn his face toward you, and give you peace. Amen. 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 His favor be upon you in a thousand generations, in your family, and their children, and their children, and their children. May His favor be upon you in a thousand generations, in your family, and their children, and their children, and their children. May His favor be upon you. In a thousand generations, and your family, and their children, and their children, and their children, may his favor be upon you. In a thousand generations, and your family, and their children, and their children, and their children, may his presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you. All around you and within you, He is with you, He is with you in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing. He is for you, 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 He is for you. You can be seated. It's really cool. I, as I sit here, I look at this screen, and as I'm singing, you know, Lord, turn your face toward you, there's a stained glass window of Jesus. I thought, wow, that was kind of cool. <laughs> we start off with a question today, and I want you to think about someone you admire, someone that has made a positive impact in your life. Think about it just for a second. Now, share with somebody next to you 
what you admire about them. Go. All right, now think of someone you don't get along with. I'm serious. Now think of someone that's kind of rubbed you the wrong way in life. Raise your hand if you don't have anybody like that. No, <laughs> I'm kidding, it's a joke. Think of someone that you've had struggle with. Got them? Now, tell the person next to you a quality that you admire about them. We will wait on this one. <laughs> no names. No names, just a quality you admire about them. Boy, that one generated more discussion for some reason. Hey, it's easy to love people we love, right? And love us? A little more difficult when we don't get along in some ways, whether it be personality conflict or someone has actually hurt you in your life, right? The Apostle Paul is talking about unity today in chapter 14. Last week we talked about love, right? Loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. And today, we're going to be looking at how we as church body, we as church partners in ministry, we as church get along. Let's pray. Father, thank you for each person here. You have divinely appointed each person to be in the seat in which they are sitting at this time, and you have something for us today. We look to you, Father, and your word to guide us in this life, and so as we read it, we pray, Holy Spirit, you will be our teacher, you will be our guide, that as we think about your word to us today, would you help us by your spirit to be more like Jesus, in whose name we pray, amen. Please turn in the Bibles, uh, in the chairs to Romans chapter 14, 14. We'll be reading the full chapter, so I encourage you to follow along. <laughs> Romans chapter 14. I'll be re referring to it again later on, so please leave it out if you would. Please leave the Bible out. The Apostle Paul writes, Romans chapter 14, Accept him whose faith is weak, 
without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or an obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord Jesus, I am fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you you are no longer acting in love. Do not by your own eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died? Do, you not, do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself but what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. Please leave those out. Last week in chapter 13... As I said earlier, we talked about love. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Paul also writes in chapter 13, let no debt remain outstanding except for the continuing debt of loving one another. Whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandment says, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, you shall not covet. Whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. It is a choice to love. It is a choice to go against our preference at times to help another person. Paul talks about a very interesting, complex, and I think of what we have read, really difficult topic to wrestle with today, is to give up what you might want because you might be offending someone even though you might not be doing what's wrong. You see, Paul is saying to the church in Rome and us today that we are to love one another by preserving unity, by not being an obstacle to another's faith. To think about how we, in this body of believers and other Christians, how we interact with one another, are we an obstacle to somebody else's faith? Now, Christian unity is important. We see it in Scripture It's defined in the Bible as a oneness, a harmony that we experience together. It's love among believers of Jesus. Now, it's not uniformity. We are all different. But showing unity is to live in harmony with one another because it displays the relationship that we see in the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God is three persons and one being. He in himself is loving one another, mutual submission, mutual love. Therefore, as a reflection of love, we are mutually submitting to one another and mutually loving one another, even when we disagree. 
Look with me in verses 1 through 4. Accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling or disputable, over disputable matters. One person's faith allows him to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not, must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? Now, it's very interesting. We see this kind of discussion between vegetarians and meat eaters here. And Paul uses that as an example, but he uses the, the phrasing, a weaker brother or sister. What does it mean if one's faith is weaker than another? It means that a person who may be weaker is more easily swayed by others' opinions. It could lead them to maybe questioning their faith or not growing stronger in their faith because they're looking at other people saying, well, I don't know, is that how we're supposed to be? Is that, is that how I'm supposed to act? How am I? A weaker brother and sister may be swayed by others' opinions. Paul is talking about this fact that we are not to be an obstacle. We are not to sway someone negatively in their building of their faith. A professor at Bethel Seminary, Mark Reisner, had some great comments about this, and I'm going to share a lot of what he had to say. He says that disagreements even go back to the earliest churches. The strong who are mentioned here apparently eat everything, observe the same days, and perhaps drink wine. The weak in faith mentioned are in the first verse of this reading, apparently abstain from meat, probably observe the one more sacred day, probably the Sabbath day, and abstain from wine. But he says what's interesting here is more significant than these differences in lifestyle. It's the attitudes of the people. Paul commands toward both groups make it pretty clear that the strong, faithful, were despising the weak, and the weak were judging and condemning the strong. Dissension in the body. Perspectives, not only different perspective, but judging one another. The behavioral differences in view here are called a diaphora in the Greek. That means indifferent things, things that don't really matter that much. Now, a diaphora means behaviors that are not explicitly prohibited or commanded in Scripture. They lie in this moral zone for each person where we exercise our conscience and decide how to proceed. A diaphora, the indifferent things. I dare you to walk around this week at work and go, oh, that's a diaphora. <laughs> I'm indifferent. Differences in how we follow our consciences always have the potential to threaten our fellowship. For example, I love these examples he gives. Ruth Graham, the wife of Billy Graham, in this example, illustrates how there can be a threat to Christian unity just in differences. Years ago, around 1970, Ruth Graham dressed to attend this banquet in Germany of some conservative Christians who were going to put on an event for Billy Graham. She attended this conservative luncheon. Now, these Christians in Germany were more conservative in how women should dress. So they were not to wear makeup or dress themselves up in any way. Ruth Graham did and wore mascara and was sitting directly across from another woman, pastor's wife in Germany. The woman was so distraught, this article said, is that the woman from Germany started to cry because she was upset about the fact that Ruth had makeup on. What was interesting is that she was crying, they say, into her beer that sat before her. So Ruth was being judged for what she wore, and Ruth was judging her for the fact that she had a beer at noon. Interesting. Another example that Reasoner gave is that he was on a missions trip to Guatemala. He knew he wasn't supposed to wear shorts, so he wore long pants. They were playing soccer that day, so he went out to play with the kids, and they were playing soccer. And there were some other Christian leaders there who said, 
to him, you know, it's Sunday. You should not be playing soccer on Sunday. So here's a guy who's abiding by some of the regulations of the country in that moment, but he wasn't doing everything. He wasn't doing everything right. So he stopped playing soccer. This is what's so tough about this chapter, folks, is at times we may have to give up what we want for others even when we're not doing something wrong. You get this? This is tough. We are to preserve relationship the best we can with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ without being a stumbling block to them. And things is, friends, we all have differences. But we must remind ourselves of our focus. Look with me. Paul writes in verse 7. Look with me in Scripture. Scripture. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Everything focuses around God. Everything. Not your personal preference, not my personal preference in this life. It's not about us. As Christians, our lives are not about us. Unity in Christ is important to our witness to the world that the God we actually serve, he changes how we live. We have no need to judge others, but to live at peace with them within the body of believers. Life is difficult enough, much less feeling judged by other people. I've got one for you. I thought of this. I thought this was good. The next time you feel like you're going to judge somebody, would you just call them up or text them and ask them how they're doing? Before it leaves your mouth, well, did you hear about... Call them up. Ask them, how are you doing? See if that would change your mind. See if it would change my mind. You don't know what's going on. Folks, each one of you have a story this morning. Each one of you is carrying something. And it's helpful in the body of Christ as we are unified together. We understand those stories. Not to judge one another. Now, friends, to clarify, in this passage, we are not talking about sin, direct sin, okay? Because we know we are to help correct our brothers and sisters if sin has entered into the picture. We are to love each other enough to tell the truth. We're to lead the offender to confession and then to grow in our faith together. That's not, Paul's not talking about that here. Preference is the focus today. We have differences. We have likes, dislikes. We have different experiences and struggles and gifts. It's important for us to know about that from one another. Why do you think we talk on the questions in the beginning? We're trying to develop community with one another, continually to know one another well. Love is patient and kind with one another. We should welcome one another in unity even when we disagree in matters of opinion. Just for example, do you like a lot of music in worship? Do you want more or less preaching? Do you want to hear the organ? Should Christians allow to be drinking alcohol responsibly or is your belief that they shouldn't drink at all? Should Christians watch only certain movies and not other movies? Is your pastor not allowed to dance? (laughs) Oops. If I wasn't a pastor, I'd be a dancer, you guys. That's just, it's just simply, simply that's the case. I bet some of you could be upset at that. Was I a stumbling block for your faith? I thought we were having a great time. This is Jack's wedding. It was an awesome time. We were celebrating. And there was no alcohol. Friends, may we not dwell on a diaphora. Choices that are neither commanded nor forbidden by Scripture. 
It's personal preference. What does it matter? But let's do our best to our ability to preserve the unity in the church. Unity not meaning uniformity, but unity meaning belief and love. Paul states, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Verse 19. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. So, what do we do? It begs the question, what really matters then? What really matters as a church to us? What matters about this church? Well, in Mark 12, we read, what's the most important commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. That's our mission statement, right? Have a passion for God, love God with all of our heart, have compassion for others, love your neighbors yourself. These words from Jesus are obviously foundational to why we gather. Now, the following, if you look at this list right now, these are the teachings that I would say we agree upon as a church. Scripture. This is read every Sunday morning. You are not here to hear a motivational speech. You're not here just to correct your behavior so you can make more money on your job. We read God's word because God's word is life to us and his spirit changes us that we live differently in the world. The Apostles' Creed, theology is very important, friends. It's to combat heresy in our world today. Heresy leads others astray. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Excuse me. Friends, those are foundational to what we and why we gather. The Ten Commandments commanded to God's people a desired way that that's what our hearts would long for, to live those out, that we would be changed to live that out in our communities. The Lord's Prayer. These are things that we say as a body of believers to teach us how to pray. And then finally, the sending network, our core beliefs. They're rooted in Scripture. I encourage you to go online if you don't know them, as we are part of this denomination now, the sending network. Go online, check on our website, and you'll see the core beliefs. They're all rooted in Scripture. You see, friends, these belief statements unify us. They remind us of why we are here. They give us purpose and they give us meaning. But what is Paul talking about in Romans 14? What is the asking of the church then and now? We are to acknowledge we are different. We have different personalities, different gifts, and they ought to unite us. And we are to keep the main thing the main thing. We are to be sensitive to how others live who claim to be Christian, to be sensitive to our convictions and how we come across to other people. Have you ever thought about that? How do you come across to other people? Loving? Arrogant, negative, positive? If you don't know, ask somebody. How do you come across to other people? We are to be sensitive to how others live. We are to be sensitive in our convictions and how we come across. Not that we don't express our thoughts and opinions, we are just to be aware of how we come across to other people. We don't want to be a hindrance, we don't want to be a stumbling block to someone else's faith. Are we encouraging to one another? Or are we judgmental? You see, our sinful nature will find it easy for us to judge other people, isn't it? Loving is more difficult, but it is how God desires us to live. And whatever we do, we should honor the Lord 
as it reads in 14, Romans 14, 3 through 9, because everything belongs to Christ alone. I heard the statement or something, a statement that was long uh, when I was an associate pastor in Orange City, and uh, the pastor used to say this a lot. He says, in the essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. This is a statement by Rupert Medlilonius in, in the 17th century. He was a Lutheran theologian. And he tries to strike this balance of unity in the essential things, the core truth that we believe. In the non-essentials, that doesn't mean that they're not unimportant, but these things that are lacking do not prevent us from a union in Christ and in liberty or charity is love. So this week, we think about how do we promote unity in the body of Christ? How do we live our life? Are we hopefully not obstacles to other people in their faith? How are we helping others who might be more easily swayed in their faith? How can we encourage rather than hurt through our words and deeds? Because, friends, the goal is that we are to make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. That's what Paul writes in verse 19. And why? That Jesus would be glorified through our interactions with one another. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us. Thank you that you make us different. You give us personalities. You give us experiences. And we pray, Father, that through all of those things, we will strengthen one another's faith and not diminish it. So, Father, help us to live this day to the full, that we would be true to you in every way. Jesus, help us give ourselves away to others, being kind to everyone we meet. And, Spirit, help us to love the lost, proclaiming Christ in all we do and say. Amen. Central Church, please stand with us as we sing the last song.
Amen. If you have any questions about the Immeasurable Campaign, Craig uh, will be, Craig Versteg will be at the display in the atrium. Now receive this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. Amen.